The attacks started on the night of January 31st, 1968. It was kind of a complete surprise to the units in the field. 85,000 North Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong guerrillas invade cities, towns, and American bases across South Vietnam. There are just people running everywhere. There are explosions everywhere. There was a smell of smoke and diesel fumes. And there was just absolute chaos in the streets. Viet Cong commandos shocked the United States with a daring raid on the American embassy in Saigon. North Vietnamese troops seized the old imperial city of Hue. For Americans at home and for the soldiers in the field, the Vietnam War is changed forever. Not one man backed off. They did what they were told. They were just also very brave. I'm Jack Smith, and these are stories of the Vietnam War, told by the people who know it best, those who fought it. I was one of them. How can you win a battle and still lose it, or lose a battle and still win it? That's the paradox of the Tet Offensive, a stunning series of bloody battles at the end of January 1968. It brought the Vietnam War from the jungles into the cities and towns, but perhaps more importantly, it changed our perception of the war. Ironically, it was supposed to be a time of truce between North and South, three days to celebrate Tet, the Lunar New Year. American intelligence knows that Hanoi has been infiltrating small groups of heavily armed soldiers into many towns and cities in the country. South Vietnamese High Command chooses to ignore those reports. Instead of being on alert, the South Vietnamese Army gets time off to celebrate. American troops are leery trust their enemy, and they suspect Hanoi will not honor the truce. They are right to be suspicious. In July 1967, Hanoi plans a major offensive in South Vietnam. Hanoi hopes the South will rise up against the Saigon government and the United States. As Tet approaches, American soldiers are still on patrol. Near Way, 398 miles north of Saigon, Marine Corporal Tom Mitchell is nervous. We knew that something was up because there was a lot of movement. We could tell there was a lot of movement. And there was a lot of intelligence coming in looking for massing and areas of crossing in the area. At Mi To in the Mekong Delta, 440 miles south of Hue, Major Ed Devlin, an advisor to the Vietnamese Army, is at a Tet dinner with his Vietnamese staff. We went to dinner and they insisted that they escort me back to the seminary where the advisors lived saying that there were a lot of VC in town. And they said, you know, at the table across from us was the VC commander and his staff. Well, I didn't know whether to take this uh, seriously or not. North of Saigon, Marine Company Commander Jim Gallagher is very uncomfortable as he and his men move through a peaceful marketplace. I remember seeing a number of um, uh, people, men, that were in the crowd that as I looked them right in the eye, I could see a sort of a glimpse of hatred uh, for me. I was uh, wary as I always was all through the time I was there. Uh, it, it was uh, a sort of a, a premonition, if you will. I had just, just this feeling that, gosh, what's wrong with this picture? They would find out soon enough. As part of an agreement with the South Vietnamese to honor their sovereignty, no American combat troops are stationed in any Vietnamese city. But in Saigon, there are 1,000 American military police of the 716th Battalion. On the first night of Tet, many of these Army MPs go on full alert, security condition red. Restricted to quarters with weapon and flak jacket beside his bunk, MP Jim McDaniel recalls going to bed that night. We went to sleep on our bunks, but with the, uh, the mattresses rolled up so we didn't get boot polish on the end of our bunks. 
and we went to bed in full gear with our boots on so that if we were called out in the middle of the night, we'd be ready to go. And we had, we'd never done that before. Military policeman James McCoy in Vietnam since March 1967 is on duty in Saigon. It was kind of eerie. We were all out by the Jeep. We're still awake. It was real hard to sleep because of all this noise and racket. And uh, at midnight, it's like somebody pulled a plug on the TV. Pitch black. All the fireworks stopped, and everything went dead silent. I mean, if you dropped a pin, you'd hear it hit the mud. That's how quiet it got. I don't think too many people slept too well that night. We kind of had a feeling we were going to be hit. Everywhere in the country, starting at 3 a.m. January 31st, 1968, seemingly all at once, they are hit. Simultaneous, well-coordinated attacks from Way in the north to Mito in the Mekong Delta. There was some kind of a major attack taking place. We got it through uh, U.S. communications channels that it was taking pr place pretty much countrywide. The next day, we could look out and see VC uh, just up the road on the other side of a bridge from us, and uh, that was the road to Saigon. The shock of all-out war in hundreds of places at once is staggering. For the first time in the Vietnam War, war in all its severity comes to cities, towns, villages, and military bases throughout the country. And it's the first time that South Vietnam's capital sees heavy fighting in the streets. And thrown in the middle of it all is the small thousand-man force of American MPs, policemen whose usual role is to keep the peace. Everybody is calling on the radio to headquarters, MP headquarters, and we have people responding to other alerts like the embassy, the radio station, BOQs that were under, under attack in another part of the city. Um, Westmoreland, he couldn't leave his compound. He was under attack. So it was just out of chaos. Armed with only M16 rifles and 45 millimeter automatic pistols, they soon find themselves in combat. Among them is MP Paul Healy, due to leave Saigon for home at daylight after completing his last four hour shift. Call started coming over the radio, people screaming, gunfire, and uh, did we responded. We, we got first place that we got sent to the Philippine Embassy, and as, as we pulled up there, where the lights were off, myself and the, another policeman, we had um, the guy behind a tree, and it was a Viet Cong, you, you could see it was, and I shot him and took, took the handgun head and just stuck in the belt. But the attack that resounds louder in the United States than any other that first day is the assault in downtown Saigon on the United States Embassy, the symbol of America's power in South Vietnam. A daring team of 19 heavily armed Viet Cong commandos arrive at the embassy by van and taxi. They blast through the embassy's outside walls and enter the grounds, guns blazing. A small contingent of Marine guards fights back. Paul Healy, here caught on TV news film, is among the first Army MPs who arrived to help fight off the communist raid. There is utter confusion. I was the first person there that was alive. There was two, two jeeps that had gone there before, but they, both, they were both dead. Both uh, but the guys were dead. The guys I worked with, the guys I was, I was on patrol the day before with, one of the guys who was in the jeep up front, he just pulled up, and he pulled right in front of the gate, and they, and they killed him right in prayer. There would be firefights that would go on for five or six minutes at a time where tracers would fly everywhere. There'd be a lot of action and then there'd be like silence. The MPs wait outside the wall while the Marines inside keep fighting the Viet Cong. First light, MPs break through the front gate. On the embassy grounds, they meet with heavy resistance. The VC had, was positioning himself, moving around this, this uh, this concrete uh, planter, he came into our view, and that's, that's when we opened up on him so he wouldn't get a shot at the, at the MPs that were coming through the gate. I mean, I had a flak jacket on, and I lost my helmet. Coming around, uh, someplace coming around the building, I lost my helmet from something. And carrying an M16, and I had the 45 on, and I had the uh, 38 stuck in my belt, so I looked like a cowboy, I think. 
The communists fire rockets at the doors of the office building, but the small band of Marines and MPs holds off their attackers. Those rockets went right through the doors like they were paper and exploded on the inside, but the doors held up, so they weren't able to get inside. They had been locked from the inside, and the Marines were then able to get up to the upper floors and shoot down on the, on the enemy in the, in the compound and keep them from uh, blowing the doors off with their satchel chargers. On the grounds of the compound, MPs run into Viet Cong hiding everywhere. He was lying behind like a flower pot, and he had rolled over and tossed up a Chinese communist grenade, a stick with a grenade on the end of it, hit my leg and dropped. I jumped behind him, and I got a piece of shrapnel on my hand. He took the brunt of the explosion. And... <laughs> One guy tried to run from around that first corner. One guy tried to run and jump up the, on the wall, 10-foot wall. It was physically impossible. Right, and I shot him. It was like a, just a straight, easy shot. It was a, and then the second guy was the guy that came was face to face with me. And I shot him and I reloaded. So I threw a grenade and the grenade exploded with three bodies came over and went upon him. I was very, very lucky. The VC on the inside was going from the front to the back and to the windows and was shooting out. We thought that there was more than one because he was shooting out of every window and every door at the people that were on the outside. Retired Army Colonel George Jacobson, assistant to the ambassador, lives in an old French villa on the grounds of the embassy. He is unarmed and under fire. I realized that he didn't have anything. And so I took my 45 and I threw it up to him. And then I threw two magazines of ammunition. And then I got uh, a gas mask from him. I told him we're throwing gas. We broke the windows on three sides of the house and threw the gas in. And that forced the last guy, big guy, about six, six foot tall, big Vietnamese, and forced him up the stairs. And when he got to the top of the stairs, uh, George Jacobson uh, killed him with my gun. And he wouldn't give me my gun back. <laughs> he kept it. He said it was saved his life. Casualties on both sides are high. All 19 of the Viet Cong die. So do four MPs, one Marine, and four South Vietnamese employees. Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker tours the grounds, stepping gingerly through the death and destruction. General William Westmoreland, the commander of American forces in South Vietnam, arrives immediately after the embassy is secure. He says the assault on the embassy is a minor incident, a battle without military significance. Because the Viet Cong didn't get inside the embassy proper, what they did didn't make a difference to General Westmoreland. But it does make a significant difference, especially in the United States and around the world. After all, the Viet Cong did breach the embassy walls and fight American troops on what is considered American soil. To millions of Americans watching the war on television, the embassy attack is stunning. America, told it is winning the war, realizes the United States is not invincible. Its flag, its embassy, and its troops have been violated. Though Hanoi does not gain a military victory, to its surprise, it scores a major psychological triumph by turning many Americans against the war. In Saigon, some of the most intense fighting of the Tet Offensive is yet to come. The battles will rage for many days before the Allies again control the capital. In Saigon, after midnight on January 31st, 1968, more than the embassy is under attack. There are calls for help to MP headquarters from all over the city. The small force of a thousand American military police left to guard the capital responds as best it can. Every time you went about two blocks, there'd be something was burning. And was just from gunfire from uh, explosions. The North Vietnamese are everywhere. Only 22 miles from Saigon, Bien Hoa Air Base, the busiest airport in the world, comes under heavy enemy attack. Lieutenant Colonel Kent Miller, in charge of security at Bien Hoa, knows it is no ordinary assault. Everything was quiet till about 3 o'clock in the morning of the 31st, when uh, an abundance of rockets and mortars came down on the base. 
but normally they were hit and run maybe five or 20 rockets. This time it just kept coming and coming and coming and it was obvious that it uh, was, was more than just a hit and run operation. Firefights break out on Bien Hoa's perimeter. Viet Cong outnumber the security police by six to one. Cooks and clerks, not normally in combat, called augmentees, fight for their lives with small arms and mortars. The battle is fierce. We couldn't get our aircraft off because the enemy was on the end of the runway. But of course, the, the air helicopters took straight off and supported us with air. And the uh, Air Force was fighting on the ground, and the Army was up in the air. And if it hadn't been for them, we'd have taken a lot more casualties. Airstrikes come in with napalm and bombs. Helicopters attack enemy positions with rockets. Tanks and armored personnel carriers pound the Viet Cong into submission. We ended up with uh, 135 enemy dead, 25 captured, and we lost two. The operations officer took a rocket in his chest, uh, and one of the augmentees got killed by a grenade. In Saigon, the invaders run into American MPs and South Vietnamese troops everywhere. A small team of 14 Viet Cong, including one woman, attacked the presidential palace. Unable to get into the palace grounds, the Viet Cong take refuge in an empty building nearby where the fighting continues. Bob Ruth, an Air Force staff sergeant who normally investigates crime, is escorting supply convoys through the streets of Saigon. He makes a wrong turn and finds himself in the middle of a firefight. We come around a turn, and here was the enemy uh, on the right, the presidential palace and the palace gardens and the South Vietnamese troops to the left. There was a tremendous firefight going on. Uh, there was nothing to do but gas it and go. We went right between the two of them and never got a round fired at us. We did take a different route back. <laughs> the small contingent of Viet Cong troops holds out for more than 15 hours until most of them die in the fighting. At the same time, the Viet Cong capture the Saigon radio station. Their plan is to broadcast an appeal to the people to revolt against the government. The attempt fails when the government shuts down the station, but not before the invaders destroy millions of dollars in new equipment. After six hours of fighting, the Viet Cong are dead, and the building is ablaze. Many of the firefights in Saigon are small, intense, fierce. One sudden clash occurs when a company of Viet Cong on its way to attack South Vietnamese Army headquarters turns down an innocent looking alley. Suddenly they run into trouble at an officer's quarters called BOQ-3. Guards and residents start firing at them. Quickly, the well-armed Viet Cong counterattack, and the undermanned Americans find themselves under heavy fire. Signal 300 is what it was called. It was a, uh, an all-out attack. It was a uh, emergency, utmost urgency. It was, I need help, I'm, I'm being shot at, I'm hit. And it just screams, it was just, uh, get the grenades going out. You have automatic weapon fire. Calls for help. And he's heading inside. The boys there, to come fire on the reinforcements. They blew the tires right off the truck, so the truck was stopped in the alleyway. And then the next thing that happened is they fired down on the truck, and the guys in the back of the deuce and a half uh, were hit with automatic weapons fire, and then they were throwing hand grenades over the walls into the truck, on top of the truck, beside the truck. Um, they basically didn't have a chance. Enemy fire is intense. Casualties are heavy. MP Lieutenant Joe Seneceros tries to get relief to the besieged men. All the, the grenades are going off, the machine gun fire. I couldn't see down at the end of the alley. I positioned a squad of men around the other side, and they immediately started taking fire. The fire was coming from the cemetery. Uh, the Viet Cong had uh, RPGs, which are rocket propelled grenades. They had machine guns. They had their AK-47s, hand grenades. They were still alive in the alleyway. They were screaming for help. You know, come down, help us. And, you know, 
they just couldn't get at them. I mean, it was total bedlam. Uh, people were shooting everywhere. So I was determined that I wasn't losing my opportunity. face was black and his eyes were like this. He said, we can't go any further. The MPs cannot move any closer. The alleyway is too narrow, the Viet Cong too well positioned. Only one vehicle at a time can get through, making it difficult for the MPs to get out their wounded. One of my men was over uh, on the side of a building and he was had propped himself up and uh, he had his black jacket on, but just blood was just, just had been hit badly. I was able to take another fellow and we went in and we were able to drag him out and uh, he was really hit bad on this, this side. There was a black soldier that got hit just below the eye. He came out and he was in shock and then there was a, another man that came out and his left arm was completely blown off. Uh, there was nothing left but a couple of bones sticking out. After that, it still wasn't over. By this time we were out of ammunition, we were out of grenades and uh, that's basically all we had to fight with. Uh, like I say, the men that were military police have been just between combat situations. In the 12 hour battle behind BOQ 3, 16 MPs die, 21 are wounded. But the Viet Cong casualties are also heavy. The men were just fantastic. Not one man backed off. They did what they were told. They um, were just also very brave. The next day, another scene plays out on a Saigon street that will change the public's perception of the war. It will fast become a horrible symbol of man's brutality to man. On February 1st, the national police and their chief, General Nguyen Ngoc Luan, are outside a Buddhist pagoda in Saigon. They believe Viet Cong troops are inside the temple. As they nervously wait, a prisoner is marched down the street. Bruises cover his face. Luan spots the prisoner and deliberately draws his pistol. Fo Su is the veteran combat cameraman there for NBC News. The prisoner Luan. And I remember that he didn't ask anything of, uh, with the prisoner yet. I remember that he's, he's waved his left hand. He said, that, you guy, get out of the way. And then he pulled a gun and shot the gun right away. The bullet hit the head of the guy, and the guy falling down, and the blood coming out from the hole in the head, and the blood coming out, spraying out like, you know, like a finger, high. Everyone is in shock after the execution. I saw troop interrogation, the prisoner, you know. Uh, they beat the prisoner, uh, but not, 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 not execute, you know, not execute. The pictures are graphic beyond anyone's belief. Within hours, they are on every front page and on every television news program in the world. But the general is without remorse. And I heard the general said that, you know that many of our people was killed by this guy, and I think Buddha will forgive me. And that's what I heard General Lan said. Elsewhere, across South Vietnam, the Air Force bombs enemy positions in the Central Highlands. They hit targets outside Da Nang. And they attack the Viet Cong along the hundreds of miles of beaches lining the coast. Fighting continues across the country. At Hue, 398 miles north of Saigon, one of the great battles of the war starts heating up. The city is soon under the control of the North Vietnamese. Hanoi's gold flag with its red star now flies over the citadel in the old imperial city. For the next three weeks, as the Tet Offensive continues its relentless pace, all the Marines in Hue will face one of the most intense 
battles of the war. It is still January 31st, 1968. While the fighting goes on around Saigon, there is another focus to the violence of the Tet Offensive, the ancient city of Hue, once the capital of a unified Vietnam. It becomes a bloody battleground for control of an important symbol of the country's past. In the months before overrunning Hue, small groups of North Vietnamese soldiers dressed in civilian clothing infiltrate the city. After capturing Hue, Hanoi hopes the people will rise up against the South and declare themselves a part of North Vietnam. But Hanoi's appeal falls on deaf ears. Most people fear the occupying force and do not come over to the communists. Though disappointed, Hanoi prepares for a long siege. During the fighting, people hide and run to safety when there is a lull. Hank Llewellyn, a door gunner on a 1st Cavalry assault helicopter, sees the battle from the air. And the uh, city was, it was burning, it was in flames, that portion. There was a mass exodus of civilians. There was total chaos. Portion, a large portion of the city was in ruins already. Marines arrive to fight the fortified invaders. Then Wunderlich and his battalion come under fire on the road leading into Way. Regardless of where you were or what you were doing at that particular minute, it was just a lot of enemy incoming um, from unknown positions and. Uh, uh, reaction uh, to return fire on suspected mortar positions and other uh, enemy locations. So it was, you know, it was dark and uh, scary and all of those other things. Hue is an old city with many concrete houses, brick walls, and hedgerows, all reminiscent of World War II. Well, Tom Mitchell finds himself in the thick of a different war. Normally we were bushfighters. We never always saw the enemy very few times unless we were being overrun or it was a really major battle. Uh, we knew we were in for it because it was a combination of NVA regulars along with uh, Viet Cong. Once in way, Private First Class William Purcell and his squad learn how difficult it is to fight through the narrow streets of the city. We climbed on board the tanks and commenced the attack into the city, not knowing what we're getting into. When we went across a small canal and all hell broke loose, they just was going through a gauntlet. Uh, there were fire coming from the buildings. And you had to imagine the scene now. It's like going through Queens or Brooklyn, New York, with all two and three story buildings, paved streets, sidewalks. Even though we had had training in the Marine Corps about house to house fighting, it was nothing compared to what we were actually going into. Despite that training, until the Marines start fighting in Hue, most of their previous action had been in the jungle. Now, with the war in the cities, many of these young men use skills they never thought they'd need in Vietnam. The people who took over were the inner city kids. Kids from New York, Chicago, Detroit, who were used to growing up in a city, knew what alleys were all about, knew what a roof was for other than the top of a building, and knew how to get in and out of things. And they just silently took over the role and, and got the squads in, got the fire teams in, and everyone just started working together and using the knowledge we had from growing up in the city. The farm kids, the kids from the ranches, the kids from the, the outlying suburbs really didn't have an idea of that. difficult, time-consuming, dangerous. Firefights break out around every corner. More than 7,000 North Vietnamese regulars have the best fields of fire. 
the South Vietnamese Army, the American Marines must fight these communist troops in churches, schools, palaces, pagodas, and the old university. The Marines make their way door to door, house by house, one painful street after another, and each man's step is more difficult than his last. As we started to move forward, we got hit very heavily outside of the church area, just at the main entrance to the split between Old Way and New Way, and started clearing houses. And that's when we found out that there was a lot more of them than there were of us. When the Marines counterattack early in the battle, they have difficulty in dislodging the North Vietnamese from their strongly defended positions. It's always an advantage to be dug in waiting than, than attacking. In, in military jargon, we always say it takes three or four times as many people to um, conduct a successful offensive action versus the number of people it takes to defend a particular piece of ground. And they were there before us. Uh, they knew the ground, and they had had the opportunity to prepare their positions. Uh, and we just had to root them out. Chaplain Richard Lyons carries an M16, unusual for a man of God, but he believes necessary to protect his Marines. If I had my choice, I'd kill an NVA, but I, I know I didn't. I just laid down coverage. And, uh, and I also didn't want to be taken prisoner. And uh, without an M16, you look like an officer. And uh, I didn't want to be in, hit by a sniper or taken prisoner, so I wanted to look like a snuffy. Just a good old little old grunt. Whatever his rank, no Marine is immune to serious wounds or even death. There is always another Marine to take his place. The Troy State, we lost so many sergeants and lieutenants and a captain, and they had to be filled by non-commissioned officers, and they were filled. The uh, position was filled. We, ne we never lacked of leadership. We lacked the uh, number of men we needed. We never lacked of leadership or courage. Despite their courage, the Marines cannot take more than one block at a time. One problem is the agreement with the South Vietnamese government not to bomb the city. Saigon wants to preserve the history and priceless antiquities of Hue, if possible, and only use America's massive firepower if necessary. Firing mortars, though, is one way the Marines attack without resorting to airstrikes. Dale Hatton commands a busy mortar platoon. Boom, it goes out of the tube, and, and with the bare eye, you can see this thing arching up and coming over and coming back down again. And it, it allows you to go from almost uh, 40 or 50 meters from the gun point out to about 4,000 yards. Hatton's mortar platoon pounds enemy positions. And as each mortar round strikes, men move closer to the North Vietnamese. And we fired, gee, many Christmas. We fired thousands of rounds during the course of that. 11,081 rounds was actually fired during that time out of this one little platoon. I'm not even sure that even during World War II, if there was ever a platoon that ever fired that kind of, of fire. And they were as good as you'll ever get. You, they could put a hundred rounds airborne in just no time at all, you know. The weather is damp and the sky constantly overcast. As the mortars fall and the men fire their M16s, they progress slowly. Still taking only one house at a time. So it was done by hand, basically, and it was a big game of tag and they were it. And we were just trying to scatter and stay out of the, uh, uh, the bag, as we might want to say. For example, if you have to get down a city block and the uh, bad guys are on the roof in the high, high upper stories, that you go into to the building and you blow a hole in the wall and just keep going through from room to room, blowing, blowing the hole in the wall. You, you ruin the real estate, but you do get up the block. started uh, learning how to street fight, we would clear a, a series of streets, and the next thing we know, the enemy would pop up behind us. And we started losing a lot of people. I know in our company, in the first uh, five or six days, we probably had about 50 killed and about 150 wounded. The wounded arrived non-stop at the field hospital just outside Way, 
where Carrie Spearman is a medic. And they just started coming, and they didn't stop coming. But it was like something that, you know, we never seen before. I mean, we've had casualties coming before, but this just, they just kept coming. You know, we had the helicopters coming in, we had ambulances coming in, we had some of the civilians walking in. They were just coming from everywhere. We just moved up there and the helicopters almost blocked out the sun. That's how many of them were coming in. Way is a different battle for these Marines, spiritually and physically. And also the sense of death that uh, happened to the city it was almost like there was no, no one out on the street you would look out or walk out onto the street uh, at different times. You had to be very careful because uh, sometimes uh, there would be a sniper in one of the buildings across the way or you know some distance away. So it was very easy to see anyone. Uh, you, you looked down the street and there was no one, not a soul. There were periods of time that you could close your eyes, pull a trigger and kill somebody. There were that many. You could see them running around. Many times that you could actually smell uh, uh, pot, marijuana, and things floating across where they're getting ready for their attacks. Just uh, a street across from you. Just a street across from you, that is the battle for Way. By February 10th, the Marines have Southern Way under control. The South Vietnamese, knowing they can't do it alone, ask the Marines to help them take the Citadel where the North Vietnamese flag still flies. Battle for Way now will take a significant turn. February 13th, 1968, the Tet Offensive is in its second week. In most of South Vietnam, where hundreds of cities have been under attack, and in the capital, Saigon, the Tet Offensive appears to be over and mop up operations are underway. We had some pretty heavy uh, infantry and artillery and, you know, armor in, in Saigon at that point, and they had rooted out most of the VC. But uh, Saigon was a real mess. It was, uh, many areas were completely destroyed. It was a shambles. In Hue, 398 miles north of Saigon, the city is in ruins. You go back to an area that you had seen a couple days before, and it wasn't there anymore. The buildings weren't there anymore. I guess my perspective was one of destruction. All I flies over the Citadel, now in North Vietnamese headquarters in Hue. Whoever holds the Citadel holds an important symbol of the past. The Marines' goal is to capture the Citadel and tear down the North Vietnamese flag. But for now, house-to-house -house fighting is brutal progress painfully slow as the Marines move into unknown territory only a few yards at a time. As we got into way, we were finding out we were having difficulties figuring out where everything was because we had no really good maps. So we would actually go into SO stations, gas stations, and uh, steal the street maps so we could actually coordinate what we were doing because we couldn't use some of the maps that we had. Each agonizing step brings them closer to their objective, but it sometimes seems impregnable. The citadel itself was uh, surrounded by a, a wall that was uh, concrete and filled with dirt, and it was probably 30 or 40 feet high and 30 feet wide. The NVA had dug back under that wall and had an awful lot of overhead protection, and so they were very difficult to get out. The odds just aren't in your favor, and yet we consistently uh, we're able to pull through with a good fire discipline, fire control, and uh, controlling fear. A lot of us already figured we were dead anyway. Uh, you get into that situation, you're not sure you're going to go home. In the bush, you know, you had chances. Here, you were actually face to face with the enemy. In bitter fighting, many young Marines are eyeball to eyeball with North Vietnamese infantry for the first time they see their enemy's face. They were uh, very disciplined. Uh, I think they were like us. Uh, they looked like they were well-fed, uh, very experienced. And they knew exactly what they needed to do and how they were supposed to be able to do it. There were an 
awful lot of there was an awful lot of contact there were an awful lot of casualties. The weather was really bad and so the helicopters uh, were having difficulty flying although we were able to evacuate most of our casualties. Because of bad weather, getting fresh supplies, especially water, is not easy, but the Marines are inventive. We started to run out of water. That was one of the key concerns that we had. As a matter of fact, we, we had actually cleared a lot of stores, uh, hands across the sea store, liquor stores, uh, buildings and different things. We started trading cases of beer and, and booze for water uh, because we couldn't get enough water up. When good weather allows them to fly, helicopters carry the wounded to nearby field hospitals. We never got to know the names of the, of the uh, patients. We knew them by wounds. Like you could say, well, hey, Carrie, you know the guy with the sucking chest wound? Then you remember him. Or the guy with his legs blown off, you remember him. But names, you never remembered. I can remember a, a Marine boat that was brought in one time and he had his leg both legs uh, off at his calves, and he looked down and he said the first thing, I'll never be able to drive a shift car again. And uh, <laughs> you don't know what that does to you. It helps you to take care of those people because they were, they were so good. As the battle to take the Citadel goes into the second week of February, North Vietnamese troops refuse to yield. South Vietnamese realize airstrikes are necessary to win the battle. They change their military strategy, and on February the 14th, fighter bombers streak in to attack. Helicopter door gunners see North Vietnamese soldiers close up for the first time. It was my first experience with actually seeing a host seal enemy on the ground. I had not experienced that previously. And when you're fired on, uh, he returned fire. But air attacks alone cannot remove the North Vietnamese. Marine mortar barrages play an increasingly important role in dislodging the enemy. Forward observers often whisper instructions to mortar platoons. They'd be whispering over the radio, and they were whispering because the uh, MVA would be just yards away from them, and they'd call in a mortar uh, barrage onto the street. You know. They interviewed uh, people that they had captured. They said, well, you know, what, what has it been that uh, caused the, uh, you know, give you the, the biggest fear, the most trouble? And they said mortars. They said the mortars, just, it just rained mortar shells. No matter how heavy the constant shelling, house-to-house -house fighting is the only way to get rid of the North Vietnamese. For some Marines, their M16 rifles are not good enough. Uh, the difficulties that we really had in the in the house to house, sometimes you'd run into hand to hand combat. So a lot of us started stealing shotguns, especially from the army, and we'd use the shotguns because of the wider pattern going in. We'd start using a lot of things with flechette rounds, so that we could sure that when we fired into a building that we could clear it out uh, and keep the enemy's head pinned down until we got in. But driving the communists from their strong defensive positions is more difficult each day. Using neighborhood census reports, the North Vietnamese forcibly draft some young men in Hue to fight on their side. Uh, we also ran into where there was a lot of conscripted people that had been chained to their machine gun nest uh, to, so they couldn't run. We had grown across several others that had been killed where we lost ground. And the, uh, some of the NVA had uh, cut off their genitals, uh, had done other things to them, you know, marked up their bodies. And there is also no end to the number of dead and wounded Marines. Well, we had, we had a lot of casualties, unfortunately. Again, you, you, just, you just couldn't. You couldn't dwell on those circumstances, and some people uh, just continued to fight, you know, for days on end, even though they may have had minor wounds at that particular stage. And then they would start shooting you from the rear, and you'd be caught in between a crossfire, and you'd have to fight your way back out. We also had a chaplain uh, that uh, had run up and back a couple times, and 
All of a sudden, the chaplain was missing. We couldn't find him. We found him with a gunshot uh, to his head because uh, the NBA had come around behind and, and shot him. Reinforcements are needed daily, but they are slow to arrive. Marines elsewhere also need help, so those units in Way still fight with too few men. While we were in the, the Citadel or in the, the compound itself, uh, we probably at that stage were no more than at 50% of, of combat strength most of that time. After 23 days of hard combat, the undermanned Marines finally reached their goal, the Citadel. The red and gold flag at North Vietnam still flies. We knew that they were, they were inside it. We never dreamt they were in there in the magnitude that they were, and that they weren't going to try to get out. They were going to stand there and fight. So that was a, that was a process of, of doing it. And when it got all through, we devastated the, the, the city itself and the, their historical sites. On February 24th, Tom Mitchell and his platoon breached the wall and advanced toward their objective, the North Vietnamese flag. We just stormed up the top, I yanked it down, we threw an American flag up, and I packed it up and threw it in my pack and said, stand with me. Too many people uh, trying to get to that darn thing because we could see it for you know several days just looking down the streets and we would only could move inches. Once inside the Citadel, the Marines meet the last of the enemy's resistance. American troops have momentum, and they keep fighting, forcing the North Vietnamese back, pushing them out of the walled city. And we were halfway through and almost cleared it out, and we were told to back off, that the, uh, the Vietnamese were going to come in and sweep through our lines, and they were going to be the ones clearing the actual Citadel itself. So that occurred, and we were pulled out. So, after 27 days of some of the toughest fighting in the Vietnam War, the battle ends for the Marines. Though victorious, they do not have the satisfaction of raising the American flag on top of the Citadel. After losing 142 killed and many more seriously wounded, the tired Marines move out as fresh South Vietnamese troops move into the Citadel. And so the, uh, the end result of that was that uh, the city was ours. And then uh, we, we packed up that very next day and went out on a sweep uh, to the north of the, of the city out there and continued to, to, to move. And it was another day in the, of your time that you had to spend uh, in the Nam. But there is something else, and that is what the North Vietnamese did to the people of Hue in revenge for not coming over to their side. I remember running across some graves. Uh, where the North Vietnamese had killed a bunch of civilians or plus their own and they'd thrown lime and just dug up graves and shot people and threw them inside. Those graves proved to be only the tip of the iceberg. Years later, the people of Hue will discover even more executions. To this day, Hanoi denies committing the atrocities. By the end of February 1968, the Tet Offensive is all but over. However, for the military and the American people, the battles of Tet will resonate long past the winter of 1968. The Tet Offensive was a turning point in the war. It was a military victory for the U.S., but as the fighting played out on television sets and living rooms back home, that almost didn't matter. Some 3,800 Americans died in the battles that surrounded Tet, and thousands more were seriously injured. Tet became an enormous psychological victory for the enemy. Seeing enemy commandos inside the walls of the fortified U.S. Embassy sent a powerful message. Despite the presence of more than 500,000 troops, we were still vulnerable. It seemed to galvanize opposition to the war. Commentators, public opinion, and even President Johnson's own advisors began to believe that victory was impossible. Johnson announced he would not seek a second term. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term. But for the men who fought during Tet, the politicians and policymakers seemed far away. As they had throughout the controversial war, they saw themselves as having a job to do. 
Uh, you don't go out and say, I'm going to be brave today, I'm going to become a hero. It, it doesn't work that way. I mean, first of all, you're scared to death. And you're so scared you can't even think straight. But the Marine Corps has trained you in such a way that you're not allowed to think. You're just to perform, you're to act. It was a challenge to do your job, uh, keep everybody alive, and get back safe. We were very fortunate. Good Lord, watch over. Heartbroken families dug up the remains of more than 3,000 people, some buried alive, others executed on the spot. These were people who did not accept communist rule and lost their lives because of their defiance. Nineteen sixty eight turned out to be the bloodiest year of the Vietnam War. More than fourteen thousand Americans lost their lives. Soon after the Tet Offensive, General William Westmoreland requested an additional two hundred thousand troops. But this time Washington said no. And as more and more Americans came to believe the war was unwinnable, it set in motion what would ultimately be a seven year long disengagement from Vietnam, the longest and costliest retreat in US history. That was the legacy of Tet. I'm Jack Smith. Good night. Get out. Get out.